Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So this is the last week. Uh, we're we're kind of wrapping up this series called Say What? That's not in the Bible. And what we're doing is we're looking at some of these common Christian phrases that we often say that we think are in the Bible that actually aren't in the Bible. And then we're actually seeing what the Bible actually says. We're using them as a jumping off point to get deeper into the scriptures and see what the scriptures say. And I think what we find out that many times these phrases that we use that we think are in the Bible, the Bible actually might say something that's kind of opposite of what we say when we use these phrases. Or maybe we use these phrases with the best intentions and they come across in a different way. And that's true for today's phrase. Today's phrase that we're going to be looking at is love the sinner, hate the sin. Anybody ever heard that one before? Love the sinner, hate the sin. That's, that's not in the Bible, right? You could search throughout your entire Bible. Love the sinner, hate the sin is not in the Bible anywhere. But I think when we say that, we have the best intentions in mind. When you use the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, when do you typically use that? Well, typically, there's somebody caught in some particular sin, and you know that, that God loves them, that God cares for them, but you also know that God hates sin. So you say, okay, love the sinner, hate the sin. That's my way of saying, I want to love you, but I don't approve of what you're doing. And that's all good. That's all great. But I think the problem is when we use the phrase love the sinner, hate the sin, typically we're using it for somebody that we actually don't know very well. And we're typically using it against a sin that we ourselves don't struggle with so that we can feel better about ourselves. So you look at them and say, oh, I don't really know you. I, don't, I, I, I know God loves you, but I really don't know you, and I really don't like what you're doing. But to be honest with you, I don't struggle with that sin, and you do. And God hates that sin. And we use that as a way to elevate ourselves in this kind of self-righteous pursuit at their expense, and we actually don't end up loving them. We actually use this phrase, even though it's not what we say, it's kind of what we mean by it, in a way where we actually judge them, and I think sometimes even put up a barrier for them to actually see Jesus. And when you look at it like from this perspective, though, that it's this issue of judgment of somebody else, guess who talks a lot about judgment and judging others? Jesus, right? Jesus talks a lot about judgment, and the one thing he does not say is love the sin or hate the sin, Right? When Jesus is talking about judgment, this is one of the things that he says. It's in Matthew chapter 7. He says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? And maybe, maybe you've You've heard this before. I think when I remember, I can remember that the first time I heard this, it kind of stood out to me because it's a little bit of a ridiculous analogy that Jesus is using. But he's talking about judgment, and we're going to get into this in just a second. But this is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God about God's ways for the world, how they're different for the world, about his grace coming to his people, how it's upside down and backwards from the ways of the world. And he says things at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, like the Beatitudes, which says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, right? Blessed basically are the people who don't have their lives all together. And then he jumps forward, Right? He jumps forward in the Sermon on the Mount and he says some other wonderful things that I think we cling to as Christians. He says things like this. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? So do not be anxious. That's good news for us. And this is where he very famously, he says, you know, look at the birds of the air, right? They don't have barns. 
They don't worry about when they're going to get paid. They don't worry about any of those things. But God cares so much about them. How much more does he care about you? How much more is he going to provide for you? And look at the flowers of the field. They're so beautiful today, but you know, tomorrow they get thrown into the oven. Yet even King Solomon in all of his splendor was not arrayed like one of these. How much more does God care for you? How much more is God going to provide for you? As Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, he's basically showing that, that Jesus, that God himself, is in control of everything. That you and I, we don't have to worry. That when our lives feel like they're falling apart, it's okay because that's where Jesus himself is working. And it's in that context where Jesus is reigning over everything where God is taking care of you every step of the way, that the very next breath that Jesus speaks comes to Matthew chapter 7, which is this again. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eyes, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? It's in this context where Jesus is reigning over everything, where Jesus is in control, where Jesus is providing for you and carrying you through every step of the way that he uses this example. He says, why are you so obsessed with that speck of sin that is in your brother's eye, yet you, right, you're walking around with this plank coming out of your own eye, right? Something like this. You got like a four-by-four fence post coming out of your own eye. Right? That, that's a ridiculous analogy that Jesus uses, right? Can you imagine that? You know, somebody walking around, their sin's so blatant, they're, everywhere they go, they're like plowing people over with, with how ridiculous their sin is. And they're going around picking on these picky little sins of everybody else. I think we'd say that's ridiculous, but I think that's how we are when we start judging people based on their own sins. We do it in a way that we build ourselves up. I think a lot of you guys know this, but um, you know, I grew up here in Florida, and uh, my, my grandparents, when I was quite a bit younger, um, in the 90s, they moved to a place called The Villages. Anybody ever heard of The Villages? It's about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes north of us, and it's like the largest retirement community, I think, in America. Nothing against retirement community or people of retirement ages, but I can remember like, when I was in like, high school or college going to visit them. And they had all, you know, had good friends on their street. And this one guy, I just remember him, he was so obsessed and he was so upset about some of the moral choices of his grandson or his granddaughter. And was talking about something, and they were serious sins that he was concerned about. But I can just remember sitting there on my grandparents' patio, listening to him talk, sitting next to somebody whom he was living with who was not his wife, complaining about that. And he was telling my grandparents how he would just go on and on and how he was trying to talk to his grandkids and they just weren't listening. And all I could think of was this gigantic four by four sticking out of his eye. Right? And when he would go to talk to his grandson about certain things, what's his grandson seeing then? Is his grandson seeing Jesus? No, his grandson seeing that four by four sticking out of his eye. Jesus says, before you deal with the sins of other people, you need to acknowledge your own sin. Because maybe you don't see it. Maybe you feel better about yourself because you don't participate in a certain sin that somebody else does. But man, everybody else sees it. Right? It's like this four by four sticking out of your eye. And Jesus continues. He says, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Those are some pretty harsh words. Jesus has just called each one of us a hypocrite. That's, that's, that's pretty harsh. Right? Yeah, God deals with sin. God does not like sin. God does not approve of us living in sin, yet we do it. And when we're so obsessed with the specks of sin in other people's, other people's eyes, we miss out on the four-by-four four that's like sticking out of our own eye. Jesus says, first, deal with your own four-by-four. Four. First, confess your sin. And remember, this is the context of the Sermon on the Mount where he's talking about how much God cares for you. 
how much God has done for you, how God has rescued you. You see, Jesus does not come into the world to condemn you. Right? Jesus does not come into the world to condemn sinners, but rather save the world through what he's going to do. He comes to save you. You see, the way you handle sin in life is not by trying to be holier than everybody else around you. Our lives are all run amok with sin. The only way you can handle sin in life, and actually you can't even handle it, is to give it to Jesus. That's the one way through sin is through Jesus who loves you so much that He comes to die on a cross in your place where your sin, where your four by four that maybe you don't even see but everybody else does nails them there and gets laid in His tomb and here's the thing. Those four by fours that you and I have coming out of our eyes, they lay there with Jesus and Jesus is raised up and you are free from that sin. Right? Go and sin no more. That, that sin no longer has power over you because of Jesus. He has forgiven you. He loves you. He cares for you. He's freed you from that sin. Jesus says that's the only way to deal with sin is through what he does. So first off, as you're looking at other people and you're saying, love the sin or hate the sin, Jesus never says that. Right? The first thing that Jesus says if you want to get biblical is love the sinner. Get that four by four out of your eye. Right? Remove the plank. That's what Jesus says. And we can do that because we can give that to Jesus knowing that he has taken on our sin. And as we do that, then we are free to love our neighbor. Then we are free to trust that just as God has handled our sin, that Jesus himself can handle their sin as well. And we don't approach them that we're better than them, but we come to them in this humble way where we are simply free to love them and point them to Jesus who can actually handle their sin and bring transformation in their life. Right? I don't think the phrase is love the sin or hate the sin. He said Jesus said simply, remove the plank, you hypocrite. That might be a little harsh for us to say Jesus can get away with it. But I once heard somebody say this, maybe a more biblical way to say this. This isn't in the Bible, but summing up kind of what Jesus says is love the sinner, hate your own sin but also do it in a way where you're trusting that Jesus has taken upon your sin and the sins of the world and the sins of your grandkids and the sins of everybody else that's out there. And as Jesus has done that, as Jesus has freed you from your sin, then humbly, simply go in love. Because that's what Jesus does for you. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, to life everlasting. Amen.